Okay. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Capital Technologies University Cybersecurity Awareness Month presentation. My name is Dr. Kellup Charles. Capital Technology University is located in Laurel, Maryland, centered in America's most vibrant technology corridor, which is between Baltimore, Maryland and Washington, DC. In observation of the month long event, we will be providing some informative topics that will coincide with the theme for that particular week. The theme for this week is fight the fish. Phishing attacks and scams have thrived since the COVID pandemic began in 2020. And today, phishing attacks account for more than 80% of the reported security incidents. So as part of week two of the Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we will stress the importance to begin, uh, to begin reviewing emails, text messages, and chat boxes that come from strangers or someone you're not expecting. Think before you click on any suspicious emails, links, or attachments, and make sure you report any suspicious emails if they do come in. Presenting today, we have Richard Greenberg. Richard is a well-known cybersecurity leader and evangelist, CISO advisor, as well as speaker. Richard brings over 30 years of management experience and has been a strategic and thought leader in IT and information security. His project management, security management and operations, policy and compliance experience has helped shape his broad perspective on creating and implementing information security programs. Richard has been the Chief Information Security Officer for 15 years, Director of Surveillance and Information Systems, Chief of Security Operations, Director of IT, and Project Manager for various companies and agencies in the private and public sector. Richard is the founder and CEO of Security Advisor LLC, which offers fully managed security assessment and penetration testing services that allows organizations to continuously assess their in internal and external risk posture and helps companies with compliance issues. Richard is an Information System Security Association Distinguished Fellow one of only 64 worldwide and has received their honor roll designation, only 55 worldwide. Please welcome Richard Greenberg. Richard. Hello, everybody. Kellup, that was a wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. And I, I believe that most of that is actually true. <laughs> so uh, I'm always glad to, uh, to help out um, Professor Charles, and I'm very pleased to share my experience and knowledge with you. Hopefully you'll find this beneficial. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end, so jot them down as we go along and I'll see if I can answer them. So uh, something's pretty fishy around here. Um, so we're gonna talk about that, but some other things as well, just good security hygiene that hopefully uh, you can all remember. And you might know a lot of this, but. I'm sure you'll walk away today with newfound knowledge. So here we go. Let's get going. Um, you've heard about me, so I, you don't need to hear any more of this. Um, but uh, if you haven't heard of OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, it's a worldwide organization of professionals uh, working to secure application and software security. Um, and I was elected to that global board. I did a two-year term, but it's filled with free tools to help you um, if you're into software security at all or will be. Uh, OWASP is the de facto standard uh, for that worldwide. Um, our objective today, this is to help protect our private information and any information that's entrusted to us. So you'll increase your security awareness um, this will teach you to recognize security threats and help you identify and resist phishing attacks. And they're very compelling. Uh, so today's agenda, will talk about the, uh, your awareness, uh, recognizing these threats, phishing attacks, some password best practices, laptop security, securing your cell phones, your thumb drive security, 
security while traveling. And I see this as a major need everywhere I go. It's just mind boggling what people do or forget or take for granted. And email security, as uh, Dr. Charles talked about. So let's talk about social engineering. The psychological manipulation that is typically very effective in gaining access to otherwise restricted information. And this takes the form of both physical, virtual, and data um, manipulation. So it comes in many forms. And it involves deceiving people into breaking normal security procedures. I've seen people who really know their stuff, but they're tricked and very easily duped into giving up uh, access to data and information. Which, well, this is what it's all about, getting the data. Uh, because data can be monetized. And on the black market, you see credit card information, bank accounts, medical records, all kinds of things. So every single person and every single company as a potential target. A uh, phishing attack, a type of social engineering, an attempt through email to steal sensitive data through tricking a person into revealing passwords or credit card data or downloading a computer virus. And that can have ramifications a bit later on. So how do you recognize a phishing attack? Well, the message will contain a mismatch URL and you'll ho hover over any link and you, you should be able to identify that. Now there are ways to get around that from the perspective of an attacker, but I'm listing things that are common things that you can do to help minimize the threats. Uh, if the URLs contain a misleading domain name, uh, the, if the message contains a funny email address that was sent to you, uh, if the message asks you for personal information, be wary of that. Uh, if the offer seems too good to be true, right? The old saying, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not. Um, it, you didn't initiate the action. Some email just comes out of nowhere from someone you don't know. Uh, if the message makes unrealistic threats, and I'll have examples of these in a little bit, so uh, you'll see those. Um, if the message appears to be from a government agency, usually the government will mail you a letter. Uh, they will not email you. Um, and then just in general, it's just something just doesn't look right. You know, when you look at an email, sometimes you get the feeling this, this is not, something's wrong with this. So here's an email that many of you might have gotten in the past. Um, take a look at it, review it, and see if you notice any things about this that will alarm you or alert you that this is not right. It's probably really not from any place where you work. Um, so I've given you a couple of seconds. Let's take a look and identify a few things that you can remember for future. You see that? email address there that does not look right does it email delivery system.com it's unlikely the company you work for correct um here's the threat we were talking about and the threat is made to elicit an emotional response to make you break your own protocols and potentially do something you normally wouldn't but if this is psychology 101 make people feel threatened and uncomfortable, okay? So keep that in mind. Increase limit. Here's a link for you to click on an email. Whoa, in the very beginning, you were reminded not to do that. Don't click on links in emails. If you wanna go to a site, then go to the URL that you know. Don't click on a link from Bank of America when you know that bankofamerica.com is the URL. So just enter that on your own. Sincerely, the email service team. Mm, is that really the name that would be used if you received an email from the place where you work or, or from the university? Unlikely. Okay, ransomware. The attempt to extort payment through use of malware that locks users out of their files or their devices, typically spread through phishing emails or by unknowingly visiting an infected website. There's a proliferation of ransomware today where basically it's initiated typically through phishing attacks. You click on something, um, you download a payload 
and that payload seeks out and encrypts all your data. That can be quite frustrating and scary when you no longer have access to any of the information in your system. And the only way you can get it back is if you send payment, typically through some type of um, cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin. Um, so that can be uh, disastrous. There's a whole nother way that we can talk about ransomware. Uh, I just wanted you to spend a couple of seconds here uh, addressing that. Uh, but uh, the main entry is through phishing. So we'll talk about that. Um, only click on links from reputable sites and don't click on those links from sponsored content. S CNN, for example, is very clever. They'll have their news stories and then they'll interject these sponsored content sites quickly right in the middle of all the other newsworthy legitimate sources. I'm not saying that these are all um, criminal sites. However, um, CNN has no, and that and I'm just using them because that's the most common that I see. They have no interaction with these folks and these the people pay to play. So you never know what you're getting if you go to these sites. And don't be confused that these are legitimate news stories. They clearly say sponsored content on the top. Um, here's a little bit of a password advice for you from our friends at Dilbert. Um, so keep that in mind. And uh, it's too bad this is not in person. I, I could hear your versions of squirrel noises. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about passwords. So obviously never share your passwords. Um, that means with anybody. Never leave a password written down that anyone could possibly see. And don't think you're clever putting it under your keyboard or uh, uh, someplace like that. Um, minimum of eight characters, although those are being compromised a lot lately, but I'll give you more tips on, on securing that. Um, but you always must have at least three of the four things, a capital letter, a lowercase a number, and a special character. Um, one of the things that can be a little frustrating with this is there are some sites that don't allow special characters or only allow certain special characters, but they'll tell you that in the instructions when you're creating the password with them. Uh, but definitely consider these. Um, don't ever mix the password you use at work with a password you use socially or on your own sites. Uh, that's uh, bad hygiene. A little more about passwords. It should never contain any part of your name. I'll explain that in a little bit. Change your password if you think it's been compromised. If you have any inkling at all, don't take a chance. It's better to be safe. Don't use dictionary words. Okay, now let me talk a little bit about this. The majority of uh, the criminal underworld buys and sells dictionaries of passwords. What that is, is when they break into systems, and this has been going on for over 10 years now, uh, they build up a database of all the passwords that have been hacked. And that's in the hundreds of thousands and millions as well. And these, these password dictionaries are sold and anyone can just pay money and buy them. Now you've got this big list. You can then run this huge database against users to see if you can get their passwords, right? So um, dictionaries, this is just getting you know, a database of all the words that are in the, in the uh, English language. And if you use a regular dictionary, that's much easier than even waiting for the criminal underworld to get these hack passwords. So dictionary words are, are basic. Every criminal who's trying to get your password knows this and runs this against you. Um, the same with sequential or repeating combinations. These are in the dictionaries as well. Don't use these as enticing as they can be. I know the whole password thing is frustrating and there are efforts behind the scenes to do away with passwords. Microsoft, for example, has a policy now moving forward on certain of their sites where they're using other things rather than passwords because they know how frustrating it can be. Uh, also don't use adjacent letters on the keyboard. 
like ASD FGH. If you look at your keyboard, that's what you'll see in the middle row. Uh, so be careful with duplicate letters as well. Um, what about passphrases? Many of you have heard of this, but others maybe not. So why don't you, let's, let's consider that. Um, let me give you an example. Here's a nice phrase. I love being at CapTech U. Hopefully you do. That rhymes. Um, so he, this is what the passphrase would be. It looks long, right? But it's just one passphrase and you know that one. So it's just as easy to remember as something that's shorter, but filled with special characters and, and numbers. Okay, so this, is, this beats that eight digit password by twice as much, right? And it's unlikely that this password will be uh, easily hacked. If you want to be a little extra safe, you can add a special character. So there's the at sign. Um, and then if you just want to even be safer and you can add a number, you can do that. I love being eight cap tech you, for example. Anyway, it's just to give you an idea, food for thought, if you want to make your life a little easier and safer, I use a past phrase. Now there are other strategies you can use instead of this, which would make life even more easy for you. Uh, first off, check out any password you currently use in this great site put together by Troy Hunt, Have I Been Pawned? Now, pawn means breached. Has your password been breached? And you, this is legitimate. I know you never want to enter a password into another system, but this will show you whether your password has been uh, uncovered in the criminal underworld. Um, and you can also put uh, your phone number in as well. So here it is, have I been pawned? And I put in CapTech U and the good news is that has not been hacked. So if you're using that as your password, although I wouldn't recommend that one per se, so far, so good. Um, some more password strategies. There's something called the password manager. Some of you might've heard of LastPass. That was a very popular common one that used to be free, but they're now charging. So uh, they're losing a lot of business, but they're gaining um, financial rewards for doing that. Uh, so what this does, it's a secure vault. And it basically, you know how good hygiene would be to rotate your passwords and make them complex, as I was talking about with numbers and letters and special characters. They will do this for you and they will do this for every single site where you register. So if you want to go to the New York Times, uh, if you want to go to Google, if you want to go to any place, including your email passwords, they will do it for you. And you don't have to remember this complex different password for every site. Remember, you need, you ideally don't want to reuse any password at any time in, in multiple sites, because if that's hacked, now multiple uh, ways to get into the, your different sites can, can leave you in a, in a bad situation but the password manager will do all this for you. And all you have to do is remember one, one complex password and passphrase to get into that site. And then they, so you're connecting to just this one site with this password, and they then will log you in with passwords that they have made up that are complex and they rotate them occasionally and you can get access to all these different sites. Um, some people swear by them. Other people will say, well, I'm putting all my eggs in one basket but this is an option. And a, a good example is Bitwarden. That, I believe that's still free and one password. I'm not sure if that's still free, but uh, those are two good sites that I would recommend. Um, another strategy uh, is to consider using two-factor authentication. Um, and there are things, a YubiKey is a small little device that you would plug into your system that would allow you to gain access to that second factor. The second factor means password would be one factor, right? Something you know and something you have, like this YubiKey, you would plug in. Now, Google uh, has an app that you can download onto your phone if you have an Android that's called Google Authenticator, which would generate rotating um, authentication codes that you can put in. So you can set your, if you have Gmail, you can set your Gmail email account to require two-factor authentication, then you can use Google Authenticator as the second factor. Um, so 
consider this as well. If you have access to a highly sensitive database, uh, you should be using two-factor authentication. If you're an administrator on any system, you should be using two-factor authentication. Um, here's another strategy that, uh, that I kind of like. Consider using the first two letters or some other trick, like the last two letters are first and last or something along those lines of any site that you go to. And then just remember one password, such as you did if you're using a password manager. Just remember that one and then add that to this. Now, here's an example. MS for Microsoft, make them caps or small letters or something. And then if you remember like a password, let's say palm trees, but with a special character, right? Now you've got capital letters, small letters, and a special character. You don't have a number, but you can add that as well. So there's that's the gain access to your Microsoft account. This is for your Google account. That's for your Apple account. I just happen to pick those three because they're kind of large. So something to think about. Um, one thing I just remembered, I left out of this presentation, you know, those security questions they ask you, right? Mother's maiden name, your, your first girlfriend, your favorite food. Don't be giving them the real answers. Now you're letting people have very confidential information just about you that, you know, you don't want out there because that's another way you can get hacked. So don't put true answers in those security questions. Right. Instead, uh, utilize a strategy similar to this. Think of one password and then use, for example, for first girlfriend, FG, and then that password. So it would be FG and then palm trees, right? Because you'll never forget that. You'll have that one password and you'll boom. And use a different password than you would normally use for your real passwords. Like, don't use the same thing. Just come up with, with some other phrase uh, that you can use for those security questions. Laptop security. I still see people making monstrous mistakes, okay? Always store your laptop in a secure place. Now, if you're in your home, your door is locked. So by definition, your home is a secure place. But if you're in a place that's shared or, uh, you know, like your office, then keep it locked up or in an office if you have your own private office, if you're lucky enough to have that. Um, try not to keep confidential information on your laptop. You know, hopefully you have a, a server at home or a NAS or a backup, someplace where your information is safe at home rather than on a laptop. If you regularly need to work on confidential, confidential information on your laptop, uh, that's different. Uh, transport your laptop in the trunk, never in the car seat. And you don't want to, of course, leave it there ever, but there are multiple times that I've been involved when I was a CISO having to address a breach where a laptop was left in the car seat when somebody just quickly ran into the 7-Eleven to get something. Um, now, this, this might seem obvious, but again, I've seen this. When you get to a destination, I see people take their laptop, go to the trunk, open the trunk, put the laptop in and close it. Now, you're just advertising to everybody, hey, there's a laptop in this trunk. So do it before you arrive. Go So when you get into your car, take it out, put it in the trunk, and then drive to your destination. Um, in general, never leave your laptop unattended anywhere. If you have a safe work environment, okay, but just never leave it anywhere else. Um, I swear I saw someone in a Starbucks get up and go to the bathroom and they left their laptop right there on the table. So maybe they were thinking about something bad. I never, I, I never figured that out. And, you know, we talked about good protocols for your car, but never leave the laptop in your car overnight, even in the trunk. It's just, there's no reason for it. Um, it's bad to do such a thing. Somebody could just be looking to break into your car or steal your car. And now they got your laptop too. And they might not have even known you had the laptop in the car but it's a nice bonus. Basically treat your laptop like cash. Would you leave a wad of 20s in your trunk? No. All right, so just think of your laptop as cash and that will be a good way to please make it safer. Um, I would strongly advise you encrypt your laptop. There are a variety of different ways you can do that, but that way if it's stolen, uh, they can't get into any of your information. 
Uh, if you have confidential information on your laptop, you definitely want to encrypt it. How about your cell phone? This is the lifeline and lifeblood for all of us these days. Crucial stuff, but we don't practice good security protocols on cell phones in general. Uh, let's see. Do you have a password or biometrics to unlock your phone? A lot of the newer phones require it, uh, but some people still are not using that or they're, you're just you know, using um, you know, one, two, three, four as a password or something. Let's be a little smarter about that, right? Just imagine if you gave your phone to a criminal and say, can you break into this? Uh, it's, you know, your ease of getting in and logging in each time versus having all your data stolen. I think you get the, the, the point. Um, make sure you have a, a screen that automatically locks after a few seconds of non-use because if you don't, and you have your phone and it's always on and always open. If it's stolen, um, my, this is a true story. My wife was on the phone walking down the street one evening in a relatively good neighborhood. Some guy rode on a bicycle and grabbed the phone from her. Now she didn't have enough time to lock it, but hopefully he took it, rode away. And by the time he stopped to look at it, it had locked. We had to change a lot of passwords that next day, that's for sure. Um, don't ever let others use your phone. This might seem like, well, it's, what's the big deal? Someone's just going to use the phone, but uh, you never know, right? You never know. Somebody who you know a, a little bit may be having dramatic financial problems. Maybe they're about to lose their home or they, they can't pay their mortgage. People do things when they're back against the wall that you normally wouldn't do. We all might do that too. You know, if, if I'm about to lose our home and I have a child, I'm going to do anything I can to protect my child. So good people do bad things. Um, make sure your phone's encrypted. That's a simple thing that you can do when you're setting up your phone for the same reasons as the laptop. So if someone does get it, uh, they can't do anything about it. Um, as, as was mentioned in the opening today, don't text confidential information either. Uh, you don't assume that texting is a safe thing. Um, try to add an anti-malware solution. You know, there are several out there, McAfee, Symantec, we've seen them. They have versions for your cell phone. And if you've been doing it for your PC all these years, why wouldn't you do it for your phone? Um, this is important, okay? You all download your apps. You got your Wells Fargo or whatever bank app don't leave auto login on because what if your phone is stolen and what if it's not locked now someone can get into your bank account and there are documented cases of people's bank accounts getting cleaned out because their phone was stolen so i know it's a big hassle but on these apps any if it has anything that's vaguely sensitive or confidential log in each time you use it again convenience for security you decide but think of the ramifications. A little more on cell phones. Um, make sure your data is backed up because otherwise if, if the phone breaks, you drop it, it's stolen, anything happens, you lose your data. That would be pretty dramatic for most people, right? Only download the apps from legitimate sites like Google Play Store or Apple App Store. They do a bit of vetting on these apps. It's not a guarantee, but it's a far safer way to get an app and know what you're getting rather than who knows and playing Russian roulette. Um, if you're working for a company, if you have a choice, don't put any company data on your phone. There's something called e-discovery. That's a legal term. Um, if there's some type of compromise or some legal or legal or a lawsuit going on with your company, if, if you have company data on your phone, your phone is now considered discoverable and they can take your phone legally, the, the opposing attorney can get a, 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 a notification and you, are, and you have to give your phone up. And now the company can look at your phone. Now, then there are things you might not want your company to know about on your phone. They're supposed to be above board when it comes to their ethics, but you never know. Um, in general, Always update the operating system as soon as the new version is released for your phone. Don't wait to do this update because you could be 
uh, exposing yourself to a security vulnerability. Delete all those unused apps, because if you don't use them, they're taking up space, but more importantly, you don't know if they're being decommissioned or anything because you don't use them at all. Um, and there's a potential for uh, someone in the criminal underworld to have come up with a way to compromise that app. So if you're not using it, just don't store it on your phone, just delete it. Um, enable the Android device manager or find my iPhone will help you if you misplace your device. Um, this, this can be pretty important. Um, and avoid, this is very compelling, I know, um, the term jailbreak or rooting of your phone means you, you, you buy a phone through a provider like AT&T and it's only good on their system. Well, this is, this is a piece of hardware that was made to be used on more than one company, but that company has a special deal and they probably gave you a good deal to buy it and you can't use it anywhere else. But if you root it or jailbreak it with, the, with some software that you download, you could potentially use it on T-Mobile or another site provided it has that hardware compatibility. But these also undermine the underlying security that's on the phone and will leave you vulnerable. So I do not recommend that. You can buy phones that are generic and can be used on multiple service providers, right? So again, uh, be smart about this. It's not all about money. Uh, thumb drive security, we forget about that quite a bit. Um, if you're storing uh, confidential information on a thumb drive, right? Make sure it's encrypted because those are too easy to lose. They're really small. They can fall out of a bag or a pocket. Um, and there have been many uh, hacks that have been done by a criminal underworld where they'll drop a bunch of thumb drives in a parking lot that are filled with malware. People pick them up, go, hey, I got a free thumb drive. They put it in their PC, you're, you're done. Uh, don't do that. Um, and then be careful of, if you have a thumb drive of putting it into an unknown PC, right? You might go somewhere and say, oh, let me put this in. This, this is a common thing for I, when, when, when I'm doing a presentation, you know, I have a backup on my thumb drive. And if something happened to either my laptop or if I had emailed the presentation, then now I got a problem. So I'll put it in, but I'm not gonna put that thumb drive back in my system. I, I will either toss it or I will use a, a, a PC that's a safe PC that's not connected anywhere, um, run malware uh, detection on that and, and reformat it. So be careful of that. Um, and again, what I was just talking about, but even if someone gives you a thumb drive and, and you know and trust them, where do they get the thumb drive from, right? People are very tricky sometimes. Um, and if you're going to give your thumb drive to someone else to use, make sure you erase all your data because you don't want them to have access to anything you might've had on there. Now, when you travel, and again, I've seen this as a big problem, um, never use, this is hard, I understand, but there's ways around it. Never use the public hotel, airport, or Starbucks Wi-Fi. I never do. Unless you have installed a VPN and you can uh, purchase a VPN for your systems. Um, and uh, the other thing that you can do if you um, are kind of strapped, take your phone and tether it to your PC and use the, the phone data service uh, on your PC. Now, again, I don't know if you have unlimited data plan, but that's, these are two options that I've given you. When you put your laptop on the machine that goes through security, watch it because security doesn't match laptops to a person. They just check the people and check devices. Your laptop can go through and you're online waiting to walk through. And five people later you walk through, where's your laptop? Oh, one of the people that walked through took it. And forget about getting help from TSA on that. You're out of it. They're not going to be running around after every single person. Hey, is that your laptop? No, you're, you're toast. So keep an eye on that laptop and don't put it down until it's your turn to walk through the scanning device. Okay. If you're in a hotel, use the hotel room safe to lock your laptop. Don't leave it out. It's 
too tempting. Um, don't put your phone in your laptop bag. If your bag is stolen, now you've lost both devices. So keep them separate. Just common sense, right? Um, if you're traveling and you want to use a, a, a PC somewhere else, um, be careful about using that public PC because you don't know what the situation is and you don't want to put your information. Don't log into your Wells Fargo account on a public PC, right? Um, I mentioned to install a VPN and here, here are three options. I use NordVPN. Uh, you can buy multiple years at a very discounted price. Here, Cyber Ghost and IP Vanish are a couple of other options. Uh, you can do your own research, but um, these are highly recommended. What it does is it encrypts your conversation from where you are to the end, and it also does not reveal your IP address. It basically, you're connecting to this service of one of these three, and then that they provide an IP that connects to the destination. So if you're, um, if you're, if someone wants to in interrupt and steal anything, they don't even know who you are, where you are. A little bit more about traveling. I mentioned you can tether your phone to the laptop to connect. Um, you can also purchase if if you're going on an extended trip and you don't want to use your phone, cell phone. You can you can buy or rent a portable hotspot. Um, that can even be used by several people, uh, MiFi, they call it. So if you have a team of three and you want internet access, you buy this little device, plug it into your laptop, and you can access the internet through that. Um, and something else, you can install HTTPS everywhere as an extension in your browser, and that will help make sure that you're being encrypted in data and transfer. Um, if you're going to marginal countries, I think it's obvious who we're talking about if you're traveling to Russia, China, North Korea, unlikely North Korea, but those other companies are open. Uh, don't bring your phone. I know it's very tempting. Don't bring it. They have scanners. There's, there's major efforts to steal your information. Just buy an, an unlocked burner phone and buy a local SIM card at your destination. It's worth it. Um, make sure all your data is backed up before you travel, just in case something happens and you lose something. Email security, okay? Never email confidential information unless it's encrypted, okay? Um, I used to email my taxes to my accountant, but I would make sure to encrypt that first. There's too much basic information in there that could make your life miserable if someone gets it. Um, don't open attachments from unknown sources, okay? And be cautious, even when you're opening attachments from the people that you know. Um, and always uh, follow your established process. Um, if there's a, a email that's people are screaming, hey, hey, this is important, click here, it's important, make the phone call and just be double safe. Uh, people don't mind getting a call. Did you really send me this? You know, they'll, they'll, they'll be fine. That's an extra step that's worth it. And uh, don't send confidential information to strangers. A lot of people ask, for an email, send us this info and, you know, why? A uh, little more on email. As I said, don't ever hesitate to contact the sender if you're in doubt of the authenticity, authenticity of the email. Um, never use an instant messenger or other secure, insecure chat tool to send confidential information. Now there is something called WhatsApp, which is supposed to be better, but since Facebook bought them, I don't know. So, you know, think about that. Um, never click on an email link ever, no matter what. You could always just go to the URL you already know, okay? Um, and don't use the same password at work as any of your internet accounts or email accounts. Here's a quiz for you. You're ready. This is a school, so, you know, you got to take the test. And I'm not there to grade it, but so you receive an email from IT security. The email says that your computer has been infected with a virus and you need to open the attachment and follow the directions to get rid of the virus. So what should you do? Should you follow the instructions as soon as you can so you can avoid the virus? Should you open the email attachment and see what it says? Should you reply to the sender and ask about it? Should you delete the message from the unknown source? 
or should you contact tech support? What do you think the right answer is? The answer is E. Now, you might think D, and that's a partially right answer, but that removes the potential to investigate from, your, uh, from the tech folks where you work, All right? And if you can't investigate, they can't prevent future attacks from that same sender or similar type of attacks. So um, you, you wanna preserve the evidence basically. So that's the right answer, E. Now, your cousin sends you an email at work with a screensaver. And they'll say, oh, you're gonna love this. We love this screensaver. So what should you do? Download it onto your computer since it's from a trusted source, right? Forward the message to coworkers to share it because you know you want to be popular. Call IT and ask them to help install it for you if you're really not very tech savvy. Um, delete the message. What should you do? Delete the message or report it to tech support, right? But again, the same concept. If you delete it, then you're removing the forensics uh, evidence. Uh, so always report it, but don't click on it or download it. I don't care who sent it to you. All right, the mouse on your computer screen starts to move around on its own and click on things on your desktop. What should you do? And this actually does happen. Call your coworkers over so they can see. Disconnect your computer from the network. Unplug your mouse. Tell your supervisor or turn your computer off. Okay. If you turn your computer off, again, the forensic evidence is gone because a lot of the stuff is stored in volatile memory, which is not your permanent RAM, um, but it is gone once you reboot. And so again, forensic evidence is gone. Uh, so you tell your, your supervisor as soon as possible um, and they can start investigating. Oh, I forgot the most famous one, research it on the internet. Well, you can do that. Actually, you should do that. You're in school. You should research everything, including everything I've told you. Contact tech support, that's the other option. So either your supervisor or tech support. I forgot I added all these extra ones on this one. That's a bonus for you. Um, here are some phishing emails. And I'd like you to tell me if they're a legitimate email or, or actual phishing and why. So let's take a look at these. Give it a moment. See if you can identify the areas where these are a problem. And these are hints that this is not legit. Okay, I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds. See if you can identify them. We talked about it quickly earlier. To avoid any disruption to your service. Okay, the threat, remember? The social engineering concept that we talked about, Psychology 101. Okay, that's the first one. So that should, make you alert and go, hmm, wait a minute. Click here. Remember, don't click on an email, right? There you go. Does that URL look correct? Something about URLs. You know, you have Microsoft.com. The way it works, anything to the left of Microsoft is a subdomain within Microsoft. So you you always look to the right to its .com, right? And then everything left so this, this one is clearly paypal.com.stz.info. No, no, that's not legitimate, correct? Um, here's an email uh, about your tax refund. Damn, I want to get my tax refund. Looks good, right? Everything looks legit here. So this one is correct, right? No, government's not going to email you about your tax refund. You'll get a letter in the mail if they want to contact you. This is not how they operate. So just ignore it. I know it's tempting and you want your refund or, or some other way, but don't, don't do it. Don't click on anything. Don't enter your confidential information. Um, here you go. Um, this is a, this looks legit, right? Everything here looks, looks like it might be a real email from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Um, but is it? Look the bottom. Shores.net, wait a minute, that's not FDIC. So clearly it's wrong just from that. So always look at the URL, as I mentioned. That's it, my friends. Thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm here. 
So uh, Richard, uh, I, as well as the staff, guests, and the students of Capital Technology University uh, would like to thank you for that very informative presentation. And if you would, we do have a few questions for you. Uh, so we're hoping that you'd be able to stick around and answer some of these questions. Hopefully I can answer it, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, one of the very first ones that we have here, and it seems like you kind of answered it a little bit, but someone had asked, what are your recommendations about using password managers? And to follow on to that question, what about adding two-factor authentication? So I guess you kind of answered that, but yeah, I guess what are some of the recommendations on password managers? Yeah, so password managers, it's up to you. It's a personal choice. I know a lot of people that use them and swear by them. It just makes life a lot easier for you. As I said, you have to remember one complex password and they do everything else for you. Again, the concept is you're here, the password manager company domain is here, you go here with that password. And that's the only time in any place anyone sees that password, just your uh, provider. They then go out to all the sites you wanna go to, right? Your, your Google account, your Microsoft account, your Apple account, um, New York Times, Daily News, whatever it is, everything. They have a complex password that they change regularly that connects. So theoretically, it's a great idea. It's all your eggs in one basket, that one connectivity. If there's any compromise of this site, they got you. But there's a low chance on that. These companies are doing a very good job. LastPass was actually had a breach, but they did not lose any of the confidential data. They just lost a couple of basic things. Um, so it's a personal choice, right? Um, and about two-factor authentication, I would recommend it on your email because it really comes in handy. And more and more, we're putting information in the email we just don't want getting out there. We don't want our email compromised. Also, think about this. Many sites, if you forgot your password, will email you something. So if your email's compromised and you can't get into a site, now they've got the email coming into the comp from the, um, into the compromised email account, they'll see it, and then you're, you're toast, as they say. Um, two more things, and I mentioned this also earlier, for two-factor, if you're an admin on any site, you have to have two-factor authentication, because admins have the keys to the city. If your account is hacked, they got everything. So that's a requirement, any place of business. Also, if you have sensitive or confidential information in a specific account, anywhere, you want to have two-factor authentication because hacking emails has become a science and there's many ways to, to break it. Hopefully I answered those two for you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, we also have another question. Um, when signing up for a new service, you have the option to use Gmail account or create new account. What is the best way um i i, I kind of like to use a separate account i don't want to tie too many things together that way if there's one compromise then you, you'll never remember all the different sites that were compromised if you're if your gmail account is hacked so i like to keep them separate i know for convenience it's much easier it's almost like a single sign-on um, but if you want single sign-on they get get a password manager then okay thank you um Another question is, if you're using HTTPS, is VPN still needed on public Wi-Fi? Yes, absolutely, because HTTPS just in, encrypts the, the transmission of data, but uh, it reveals your IP, um, and it also uh, does not prevent you from being compromised. So, uh, yeah. HTTPS is just the, the protocol, and most sites today are using HTTPS, but it does not give you the uh, protection that you need to avoid uh, a breach. Thank you for that. Um, are vision and smission attacks successful on my phone? What can happen? Well, um, any kind of attack that compromises your phone can get access to any of the information on your phone. Um, so it depends on what you store there. 
Um, also, and I mentioned this earlier, if you have automatic login enabled on your phone to any apps, such as your banking app, they got access to your bank account. And that's not something you want. So two layers of protection, never enable auto login anywhere. And try not to store confidential information on the phone. I know that's difficult and most people have to. For example, if you're traveling, you maybe have a copy of your passport, your driver's license. Even, some people even have pictures of their credit card on their phone so they can easily access them when necessary. Um, so the odds are you have some confidential information on your phone. And so you wanna be careful not to let that phone be compromised. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, we, we have a few more, but I'll, I'll give you about two more so we don't <laughs> exhaust you because I know of the time difference with you being on the West Coast. Um, we have another one here. Um, I guess this is kind of talking about a statement that you made pertaining to emailing your taxes. How can someone get your unencrypted taxes if you email it? I guess they're looking for a scenario or how, how can it actually happen or something? Because email is not a secure uh, transmission protocol. The, the HTTPS helps but there can still be ways where it can be compromised. So what you need to do is assume that email and texting are not secure. And if you have something confidential you need to send, then there are ways to encrypt it. There are, uh, for the few times that I need to send something, there's a free um, email service called Hushmail. I, I quickly register for that account. Um, it's only good for, I think, 30 or 90 days, something like that. But, you know, for once a year that I send my taxes, I go in there, create an account, send the email, it's encrypted, and I feel I have a peace of mind. Now, um, there are, if you work in a, in a company, many of them have encrypted email uh, capabilities too. I was a CISO in, in the health field, so we would send emails out and the recipient would have to then log into the site where the email was saved, um, validate who they are, and then they, they can read the encrypted message. Okay, and uh, for the last one, let me see which one I'll select. Uh, why are hacking tools, why are free hacking tools available if it could cause damage? Ah, because we don't live in a perfect world. There's a criminal underworld that is a multi-billion dollar industry. They sell tools on the dark web and they even sell it with uh, maintenance and support, just like you would buy a legitimate software tool today from a legitimate source. Uh, so they'll, they'll sell it and someone will buy it. Um, in, the, in the old days, you have to be a good a hacker in order to become a, a criminal um, hacker. And by the way, the term hacker is misused. It's not a bad person because there are good hackers that help save us, that identify flaws and problems before they are um, discovered. And that way they can uh, notify the companies to fix them. So um, please do consider this. And uh, with that, thank you very, very much. Got to run. All right. Thank you very much. And again, I thank you all for taking the time to join us on this week's um, presentation. And uh, as always, we'll send some more information for some upcoming presentations that we have for week three and week four of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Thank you all. And until the next time.